So let's go back to Kreplin. We always like to go back to Kreplin in his seminal phenomenologic studies of presentations of bipolar disorder over the course of time. We have learned that in orange in the middle, um, the, the presentation of simultaneous high energy activation and low symptoms, that is mixed features, increases in prevalence over the course of the lifespan. So as patients are followed over time and as patients present early in their illness versus at middle and later stages of the disease, um, depression per se, as important as it is, tends to give way, as you see on top, to an encroachment of more mixedness over time. Sometimes mixed presentations are very obvious. Sometimes one pole is dominantly obvious over another. The, the, the floridly manic patient who's talking a blue streak and is energized and, you know, it takes about five seconds to identify the, the press of mania may not permit such an obvious determination as to whether they may be hopeless or suicidal, negativistic. Um, uh, takes a little bit more deep looking. I can recall years back when we didn't really think so much about mixedness as being on this continuum, uh, we kind of went with what we saw. So the patient's obviously manic. Why would you even ask if they're suicidal? We know mania is not a risk for suicide. It's the depression side. Well, actually, it's the mixture in the middle when we see the activation of mania with the hopelessness and despair of depression that we really worry someone might act on suicide thoughts. When they're energically, motorically retarded and depressed and have suicidal thoughts, uh, we might think, you know, gee, if, if they start to get manic or mixed, they may be more inclined to impulsively act on those thoughts. So there's this real interplay between high and low that I think he's, he's pointed out. And again, away from the notion of categories, but more toward continua, um, here's a way to think about, let's call them dimensions of psychopathology. So. Uh, I always like to think about how bipolar disorder is not a mood disorder, it's an affective disorder. Anybody here old enough to remember those pre-DSM-4 days? Uh, what is affect? Affect is behavior. It's a behavioral manifestation and expression of the subjective experience of mood. So you can determine or at least anticipate someone's affect you know, based on are they motorically activated, are they are they motorically retarded? Are they um, expressive? Are they uh, impoverished? Uh, as, as a consistency, we think, with how they subjectively feel. If I tell you, um, yeah, I'm really happy and euphoric. I'm on top of the world. It doesn't really add up. I mean, you know, it's striking. You're a clinician. You're thinking, you know, what I see doesn't match what I hear. Or likewise, if I'm telling you that I'm so depressed and need an antidepressant, you have to give me an antidepressant because I'm so depressed. Likewise, you know, gee, I don't see the, the matchup between what I hear and what I, what I see. So Kreplin invites us to consider these domains, thinking, mood, and behavior. And either of these can be basically up or down. So you can have a surplus excess of thinking, lots of ideas, lots of constructs, uh, or, or a, a very minimal degree. Perhaps most obviously a negative symptom, schizophrenia. One might think about the impoverishment of thinking. So. Uh, it's hard to generate thoughts right, in deficit states, as well as in depression. But then let's match that up with mood. So uh, uh, depressed mood and depressed affect is, is, is kind of a positive symptom in a way. It's a manifestation. If someone says, I'm depressed, as opposed to you know, the, the sort of affective corollaries of that, it's much easier to see the presence of sadness, of despair, um, the expression of anhedonia as opposed to the absence. And then behavior, likewise, motor activity. Uh, we'll see in a second, uh, actigraphy studies, you know, just measuring how much people move around, locomotion, sleep-wake cycle. This sort of makes for the interesting story of what is it we're treating. So to say this is a mood disorder isn't really giving justice to the complexity of this, to me uh, and many of us, fascinating illness that, that affects all these things. So at the extremes, you can say pure mania where thinking is up, mood is up, behavior is overactive. That takes two seconds to spot. Or uh, pure, energic, motorically retarded, impoverished, slowed down, pure depression. The, the extremes are easy. It's these variations in the middle that I invite you to think about with your patients. So, you know, gee, they're thinking fast, but their mood content seems to be blunted and negativistic, and it just sort of inspires our thinking not just about what's going on with the patient, but how do we want to treat them as well. 
So in DSM-5, um, uh, the concept of mixed broadened away from DSM-4. DSM-4 was quite rigid in saying a mixed episode is defined as the full syndrome of a, mani of a mania. So you, know, you have to have the requisite number of symptoms for at least a week. It's got to impair your functioning. So it's a bipolar one mania simultaneous with a full syndrome of depression. I often think the DSM sort of has two different audiences. There, there's, there's, um, there's the research group, uh, and I sometimes live in the research world, where one is, is sort of counting through symptoms and um, not quite checklist style, but are criteria met. So you have to have this, but this, and not that, and does it last long enough? And when, when one's doing a research study, one enrolls prospective patients based on do they meet the criteria. So DSM, in, in some ways, is a criteria document that's helpful for researchers to say, you know, you're in or you're out. But then there's, then there's the clinician world, then there's the patient world, where criteria don't necessarily bear in quite the same way. So, oh, somebody comes to you and, you know, what brings you here? Well, I'm really depressed, I'm suicidal, I have no energy. And it's been going on for, for 12 days. Okay, come back in two days. If you have two more symptoms, I'll treat you. Nobody, nobody does that, but that's sort of the way the, the DSM is, is kind of constructed. So uh, I think for better rather than for worse, DSM-5 has broadened the construct of mixedness to say, all right, you don't need a full syndrome of the opposite pole. You need some salient symptoms of the opposite pole while you're having the other syndromal state present. Um, and you know, they can't really overlap, so you can't double dip. If you're, if you're distractible because you're depressed and your attention's hard to focus, or you're distractible because you're manic, you know, it's a little bit hard to tease out or indecisive. You know, insomnia versus the loss of need for sleep. Important constructs, but DSM-5 encourages us to be a little more oh, uniform and, and not double count symptoms. Um, and then it does a few more things. So it, it also says this can happen in bipolar 2 disorder as well. <clears throat> How many of you have patients with bipolar 2 disorder? Okay, and the rest of you may or may not realize you have patients with bipolar <laughs> 2 disorder. And how many of you find that when they are in a syndrome of depression, they may have at least some of these motor activation symptoms? Okay, so prior to May of 2013, when DSM-5 came out, they didn't exist. You couldn't call them anything. You'd have to call them bipolar depression. Period. And as you're hopefully hearing more and more about today and in general, when there are mania symptoms of any kind coexisting with the depressed side, the course is different, the treatment's different, the outcome's different. So DSM-5 finally caught up with reality and clinical practice in pointing out, okay, even if you've never had a full mania, subsyndromal mania symptoms can often occur in bipolar depression. Um, and vice versa as well. And then last but not least, as I said a little earlier, if you've never had a full-blown manic or hypomanic episode, but you have the syndrome of major depression, what if you have some features of the opposite pole? That got counted as nothing before. DSM-5 calls that major depression with mixed features, or MDDMF. Is that, is that a contrived concept? I don't think so. Uh, I think it's actually inviting us to pay attention to what we're seeing. So we've all been trained in, in the DSM era. Uh, as you're going through history, you're in a major depression, never had a manic episode. My mindset now goes down the SIG e cap symptoms of depression and all that comes with it, rather than, well, wait a minute, does your thinking get distracted easily or, or go off in different directions? Do you find that you're you can be very sort of energized. Uh, maybe that's what, what they used to call an agitated depression. What does that even mean? It's not in the DSM, agitated depression, but it's a concept, you know, you know it when you see it, where, where there's this sort of psychomotor activity going on and you're depressed. So it encourages us to, to sort of think about these symptoms. And rather than say, is the, is the patient bipolar or unipolar, a la DSM-5, mixed features lets us kind of say there's, there's aspects of both present. So let's talk about how that bears in terms of treatment. One last thing DSM-5 did that I think was a real useful innovation was it pointed out, again in the spirit of an affective disorder rather than a mood disorder, that energy changes are paramount. That is, high energy states are now a necessary criterion to diagnose someone as having a manic or a hypomanic episode. Time was, you just needed a change in your mood, and energy changes were, were optional, so-called B criteria, you know, if you're going through the menu of things. 
DSM-5 says, no, 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 no. So you gotta have a change in your mood, but you have to have a change in energy. So I can't sit there and say to you, oh, I'm so manic right now. <laughs> and then I fall asleep. Not only is that a mismatch, it, it just doesn't fit. You know, you, you, you know. And likewise, if I say to you, I'm not manic at all. I'm not manic. <laughs> but I, I can see the, vis the physical manifestations of high energy. You know, no matter what you say, I can observe what I'm seeing. So this comes from, I, I think, the other nice thing about DSM is it's evidence-based. There's actually been some really nice research over the last 10, 15 years um, identifying that if you go through studies and look at what separates out distinct groups of these are unipolars and these are bipolars, the thing that tends to come up more than anything else is high energy or activation, psychomotor activation. That can mean speech and language, it can mean sleep-wake cycle, it can mean motorically, so stick an actograph or a Fitbit on your patient and download that and they, they, they wiggle, they move around a lot. There's just more motoric activity. This is a very nice uh, review by my colleague Jan Scott in England um, who, who basically reviewed the literature earlier this year in identifying, okay, what, what parses out the unipolars from the bipolars um, and, and found that high activity, high energy states, was sort of the thing that literally leaps out off the page on the left there um, as the, the key separator of bipolarity. More important than mood. I mean, you, you could almost say, I care less about your mood than your energy. I didn't say that. But in a way, it, it does sort of might us think about just like a silent myocardial infarction. Um, or for that matter, you know, someone who's, who's having uh, uh, angina but, but no subjective signs of pain. Mood is kind of like the pain aspect um, in angina. But if you see and observe and hear about high energy states, that, that has to be your, your tip off. Uh, this is called a spider plot or, or a ra radar graph, and it's kind of a, k kids do this in school, it's kind of a way of saying, take the central construct of importance, and then tack onto it the things that jump out the most, that are most important. So the things that jump out of the page and on the side of mania is, uh, is high energy, high activation, m more than most other elements. So pay, pay attention to high energy states. When co-occurrence of high and low co-occur, it's not good. How many times have you seen slides of, here's a phenomenon and it's not good, and here's all the bad things associated with it, and you start to wonder, well, yeah, but isn't, isn't one bad thing confounding something else? So early age and onset confounds substance abuse and many episodes and you know, having been born in the month of May, or you, you think of all the risk factors. Um, mixedness tends to be a pretty good spoke in or, or hub the middle part, and identifying, you know, if I can trace back co-occurring high and low symptoms, then all these sort of undesirable things seem to, seem to correlate with that. So more episodes, higher suicide risk, longer duration of episodes, more substance abuse. Um, Dr. McIntyre didn't talk nearly enough about the work he and others uh, have done in terms of excess cardiovascular disease and the systemic manifestations of mood disorders, inflammation, uh, uh, increased mortality, not because of suicide, but because of cardiovascular, pulmonary, and metabolic problems. So, uh, uh, rapid cycling. So, so, I wouldn't say, okay, mixed is the cause of all these things, but you know, it's kind of like, gee, it always shows up. And it's like that person that's always in the picture. You know, there's Uncle Hal. Hal. He's always in the picture. How'd he get there? M mixed features tend to always be in the picture. When, when bad things are happening in, in bipolar disorders. So if it's not causal, it's at least, it's at least a corollary. Um, here's some data, speaking of Dr. McIntyre, uh, from his research group looking at bipolar one and bipolar two disorder patients while in a syndrome of depression and identifying the extent to which, well, DSM-5 mixed features uh, occur. Um, DSM-5 mixed features was a construct that was put forth by the, the organizing committee a lot of the empirical work on the definition all sort of came afterwards, and I think Dr. McIntyre's done a lot of that work. So he tells us in a syndrome of depression, interestingly, bipolar one and bipolar two patients are about comparable, about a third of them in his sample would, would meet the DSM definition of mixed features. And to me, even more interesting, if you count up unipolar depressed patients, at least a quarter, while in a syndrome of depression, will manifest signs of mania or hypomania but not have bipolar disorder. Is that just like a technical point? No, it, it means like if I have um, a cough and a sore throat, it doesn't necessarily mean I have pneumonia, 
although I might be at risk for it, or if I'm having, I don't know, GERD and stomach upset, don't, don't diagnose me yet with, with stomach cancer, but you might start to think, gee, these, these, these hoofbeats are starting to sound like something. I need to pay attention. So unipolars can certainly sometimes go on to develop bipolar disorder, uh, and the ones who have these low-grade mixed features tend to be on that list. Here we look back again uh, at, at the notion of mixed features now as, as residual symptoms. So on the left-hand pie chart, take a group of bipolar disorder patients who are hypomanic or manic, and then they, they improve from their identified episode, and you find that if you look at subsyndromal symptoms or persistent residual symptoms after they're better than they started out, over 90% of them will manifest manic or hypomanic symptoms. This is important because it's, it's not going to be as glaringly in your face as would be the case, say, if they're, they're in the emergency room and they're screaming and yelling and an ambulance brings them in. That's the obvious kind. This residual sub-threshold mania or hypomania may not be there if you don't look for it um, or if you elicit the history from a collateral historian, a corroborator, or a family member um, uh, where, gee, you know, he's still depressed and he's not getting better, uh, maybe we should raise his antidepressant, well, hold on, you know, is there anything on the distractibility side, the, the motor activation side, the talking fast side, the, um, the, the, the over-energized side? Because if there is, the reason he's not getting better from the syndrome may not be because the depression is undertreated per se, as much as the syndrome has residual symptoms that more often than not, 90% of the time, include the low-grade mania things. On the right-hand side, same idea in a syndrome of depression. 70% of those people will have subsequent residual hypomanic symptoms, but they didn't come into your office saying, hello, I'm hypomanic. They came in, I'm bipolar, I'm depressed. And then you treat them, and then you judge they're better, and then 7 out of 10 have these previously perhaps not even recognized, low-grade, but clinically important hypomanic symptoms. It's a relapsed risk. Not so surprising. So if you have residual symptoms of uh, mania, that's the, the brownish box at the bottom, you can see about three quarters of patients with subsyndromal mania symptoms will go on to have a full-on relapse, and about 40% of those with residual depression symptoms will go on to have a full-blown relapse. These are some older data from the NIMH Collaborative Depression Study. What I think is especially interesting here is, again, subsyndromal low-grade mania symptoms. They don't get noticed. Uh, in fact, you might even think, oh, he's looking better. Notice how much he talked in our meeting today. That's good. That's good. Maybe, maybe, but you know, what was he talking about? He was talking about how he's going back to work and he's going to start brokering some deals and he's going to borrow some money from his brother-in-law and you're thinking, well, you're not depressed anymore. Okay, that's a good thing, isn't it? Isn't it? Maybe. I mean, this is, I think, where our expertise really has to come to bear and not just say, gee, you know, John, I'm, I'm really glad you're not, you know, when I saw you last time, you looked so down and slow, and now you certainly seem chipper. Isn't that a good, good, good thing? You know, mood charting can help here. I like slopes. I like math. Uh, uh, so if you're, if you're doing mood charting with patients and you're tracking mood symptoms day by day by day, uh, over time, you can tell, is there, is there an ascent? And the patient who's down, and then suddenly, I'm not down anymore. Dr. Goldberg, you're a genius. I saw you Friday, Monday morning. I went out for a jog at four in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> then I get a call from the spouse. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so that's not a slope that I like to see. In fact, I'm, I'm actually far more comforted often than the patient might be when they come back in a week or two and they say, you know, go through their symptoms maybe I'm a little better, and they look kind of, you know, not happy about that, I'm thrilled about that. I'm much rather, uh, I want to hear their trajectory where you're a little better, and the slope is going like this, as opposed to, I'm a whole lot better. Or even, I'm no better. The plateau is here. So I really like that slope. The first two weeks, I'd like to see a 20% improvement, not a 90% improvement. improvement. Um, and it's easy to miss the low-grade mania symptoms. You have to track them over time and pay attention. Um, this is showing that persistence of mixed features is, is longer, it takes longer to recover from a mixed episode than a pure depressed phase of bipolar illness. Uh, it could go out for months and months and months. So that same individual who's been fully depressed and is then starting to develop mania symptoms, uh, DSM would call that a mixed episode, not, not rapid cycling, it's a mixed 
episode. They haven't recovered yet, so they're still simultaneously within the episode having some high and low symptoms. They're not going back to work next week. Uh, in, in the U.S., where I practice, and we have something called managed care, uh, you know, you go in the hospital, your length of stay is about three hours, and um, then you're, you know, you're back out on the, on the street or back home, and it, it fosters the illusion that you're better uh, as opposed to you're, you're dischargeable. And can I go back to work tomorrow or back to school tomorrow? You're going to fall on your face uh, prematurely, especially if there's mixed features present. And as I'm saying, even low-grade mania symptoms can easily get missed. Here's the NIMH collaborative study data that is probably the best prospective data tracking bipolar depression, uh, sorry, major depressive disorder going on to bipolar disorders, so the, 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 the polarity conversion, as, as sort of mediated by did you have subsyndromal hypomania symptoms. So this study was ahead of its time. Before DSM-5, it really speaks to the, this entity of syndromal depression in unipolar patients who have low-grade symptoms. And as it turns out, the more mania symptoms you have, the higher the chance you're going to go on to develop over the coming weeks, months, years, um, a manic or a hypomanic episode. And it was about 20%. So put more simply, uh, no, it's not an automatic proxy that if I see even a couple or three mania symptoms that don't meet the definition in a bipolar patient, just assume they're going to turn out to have bipolar illness by DSM criteria. Some do, but it's not the majority, at least not over 1,500 weeks of follow-up. In this, in this one study, it's about 20%. Now, you can't just take this one symptom in isolation. So this is where the detective story gets more fun and interesting. Gee, I notice to myself, I notice you have some mixed features and you've never met the criteria. What else do you want to know as you're building your story? Uh, and I was saying mixedness is the, the Uncle Harold that's always in the picture, it's always there, but there's other things that'll help build the story. Family history. Uh, I can't help but notice your monozygotic twin and your mom and your dad all got hospitalized many times over for lithium-responsive bipolar mania, and you, you've only had three mania symptoms lasting two days. Uh, okay, well, that, that's a helpful corroborator. How about early age and onset? How about the, 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 the degree of atypical depression symptoms, psychosis, the common comorbidities, the course over time? You know, this is my 17th depression. Really? I mean, most depressions can recur, but you know, highly recurrent patterns. Did you ever take an antidepressant and it had that paradoxical effect of making you more hyper and energized? So you're building a story. This is what I always liked in, in psychiatry. If I couldn't have been a psychiatrist, I'd probably want to be Columbo or some detective and say, just one thing doesn't add up about the story, but you're, you're building a story, you're putting pieces together. So mixed features are an important part of that story, and about one out of five such people will go on to have a full presentation of mania or hypomania. So don't pull out the lithium just yet, but keep your eyes on the patient, pay careful attention, and elicit the corroborative signs that'll guide you as to where this may well be going. Okay, but should I avoid antidepressants in these people? So the honest evidence-based answer is nobody really knows because MDDMF didn't exist, at least officially, until May of 2013, so there are not prospective evidence-based studies to really guide and inform us. There's some retrospective data, and what there is you know, certainly doesn't speak to the wonderful things that antidepressants do in major depression with mixed features. This is some European data saying, okay, you have the syndrome of major depression with some low-grade mania symptoms on top, but you never made the definition of bipolar disorder, and they gave you antidepressants, and now you're three times more likely to have an exacerbation of those mania symptoms. So we all may, may be nodding our heads saying, yeah, of course, I know that. Well, it, it certainly intuitively makes sense, uh, but it actually hasn't been so formally studied. So this is actually helpful data. So don't leave here today saying, oh, he said, never use antidepressants in mixed features. That's not quite true. Um, be very, very aware of the presence of mixed features, and um, don't, don't just hear the depression side and assume an antidepressant's the way to go, because if there are mixed features, okay, I might now be tripling your chance of going on to develop a worsening of those mania symptoms. Um, and I, I just need to tread very carefully. I may very well not want to use antidepressants in this patient, <clears throat> but I need more information, so let's get some more information. This is some data we published from the NIMH Step BD study following a few thousand patients over several years, and we collected the ones who were in a syndrome of depression, 
all bipolar one or bipolar two, half or more had these low-grade mania symptoms while syndromally depressed. The most common ones are shown on the right, distractibility, flight of ideas, racing thoughts. So, so activity, you don't often see euphoria with depression. You can. You know, I'm happy one minute and down the next. But more often, you'll see the, the zoomy aspect with depression. <clears throat> Another reason why this is not a mood disorder. It's an affective disorder. So um, mixedness, mixed features are common. Here's a couple of studies speaking to this question of, well, are antidepressants, are they the kiss of death, or they should be avoided at all costs, uh, or does it depend? So let's have a look. On the left is the STEP-BD data where we showed if you have bipolar depression and you're taking an antidepressant with a mood stabilizer, your depression doesn't get better. The antidepressant doesn't help, right? Um, in in, the, in the, the main step BD study, we found that there was actually no difference in even whether antidepressants made you manic. Antidepressants were a big waste of time in step BD, where we found above and beyond a mood stabilizer, not very much efficacy, nor much liability. Antidepressants were kind of neutral. They just didn't make things better or worse for most depressed bipolar patients. But if you break out the ones who have even low-grade mania symptoms, uh, as shown in the yellow box at the bottom, we have this interaction effect, where if there's even a little bit of mania present, it blossoms up. It, it's like uh, I have just little, little bitty embers smoldering here, and oh, here's my lighter fluid. What happens if I do this? Well, you, you have an accelerant to the flames. If there are embers there to begin with, the low-grade mania symptoms are those embers in the antidepressant. In that instance, was, was the lighter fluid. Whereas if there's absolutely no, abs you've been very careful and assiduous and evaluate, no mania symptoms at all. You are a lump. And you've asked all your dig fast questions and are you sure you're not manic? And you know, do you have a pulse? I mean, you look so depressed. Um, there, antidepressants as lighter fluid don't really make things more manic, they just don't make you better. So we still have yet to see antidepressants help, but the important takeaway here is if there's even low-grade mania symptoms during depression, mania symptoms can get worse. As we saw in STEP, on the right is some Stanley Foundation data, very similar kind of finding even low-grade mania symptoms during bipolar depression led to an exacerbation of those mania symptoms when an antidepressant was given. So let's go deeper into this issue. Are antidepressants good or bad? Are they safe? Are they effective? Uh, the name does imply they should be helpful, right? Uh, this says, of course you feel great. These things are loaded with antidepressants. One in five Americans takes a psychotropic drug. A little international data for you. And depression affects one in five people in the world. So antidepressant does sort of make you think that they're, they're going to do that. Do they? Do they help? Seldom is, is absolutism the way to go in anything, but especially in, in, in the world of bipolar disorder. Um, depends. Depends on context. So uh, bipolar 2 disorder actually has a fairly low risk of inducing mania or hypomania with an antidepressant as compared to bipolar 1 depression. And so even some expert guidelines we'll see in a second say, Okay, if we're going to use an antidepressant in bipolar depression, let it be a bipolar 2 depression, not a bipolar 1. And there's even a few small proof of concept, placebo control, but small sample size studies looking at antidepressant monotherapies in bipolar 2 depression. One published just a year ago, an earlier one published uh, a couple years ago out of uh, a group in Pennsylvania showing that fluoxetine was better than a placebo and even better than lithium in treating bipolar 2 depression. That's monotherapy. Some people think and, and would say, bipolar 2 is a different illness. It's got different genetics. Uh, by definition, you never get manic. By definition, you don't have psychosis. Uh, and the depression tends to be awfully bad, but it's, it's, it's less prone to be contaminated by some of the things that may make bipolar 1 disorder bipolar 1 disorder. Real quick, here's that step BD study I said earlier, um, which shows that on the left, getting better and, and really meaningfully getting better was, was no better if an antidepressant was added to your mood stabilizer than if you had a mood stabilizer alone. You had about a one in four chance of success, which in, in, bless you, which in, in my family we say meh to that. And on the right, the chance of getting manic or hypomanic to everybody's surprise was about 10% with an antidepressant plus mood stabilizer or even with a mood stabilizer alone. 
So $26 million studies said antidepressants for most bipolar patients aren't relevant. You have to treat a lot of people before you're going to see somebody get better. Number needed to treat, 29. That's not very good for the first 28 people, but if you're the lucky person next in line, there you go. So we'd like a single digit number needed to treat. That means if you have meningitis and your infectious disease doctor comes in the room and says, well, there's good news and there's bad news, Joe. Bad news is you have meningitis. Good news is I have this treatment for it. Oh, what's the NNT? 162. <laughs> no, 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 no. I want an NNT of one or two or, or three. And bipolar illness you know, can be lethal. So, so we really would like a, a single-digit NNT. So th this, is, this is rather ominous in terms of expectability that it's going to be helpful. Uh, some Canadian research from Glenda McQueen have to acknowledge. Um, but but you know, many clinicians think the real hazard with antidepressants is that they're going to make you, they're going to make you manic. Just, just put a bipolar patient in the same room as a bottle of sertraline and they'll be flying around. That's probably not an accurate statement. The number you get to harm is actually pretty high, again from Dr. McQueen's meta-analysis, 200. So yeah, you certainly could get manic with an antidepressant, but it's not that likely when you look at all comers. It's about 10 or 15 percent, and as we'll see in a second, you can better identify who that 10 or 15 percent is. The bigger concern is they're not going to work. They're not going to work, and there's a chance that they may make you worse. Sign me up. Well, well, discouraging data on the antidepressant. Uh, again, my message is not should you or should you not use them, it's when. And the best of studies would tell us that about 10 or 15 percent of card-carrying, depressed, bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 patients who really benefit from an antidepressant. In bipolar 1, that's with a mood stabilizer. In bipolar 2, maybe, maybe not with a mood stabilizer. But here's the clinical profile that, that I would recommend culled from the literature. So on the left, you know, here's your bipolar depressed patient. When might you think an antidepressant may be not a bad idea? You're bipolar 2. You are pure depressed phase, so none of this low-grade low-grade mixed stuff. You don't have many episodes per year. That, that's a pretty established predictor. Antidepressants don't help. You have not recently been manic or hypomanic. You don't have drugs or alcohol. Uh, if you've ever taken an antidepressant before, you have good things to say about the experience, and it's never caused a mania or a hypomania before. Sadly, we don't get a lot of these people. And in the best of studies that were done, the Stanley Foundation research <clears throat> had about 10 or 15 percent of such individuals. Bipolar 2 patients who have this profile do fine with an antidepressant, 10 or 15 percent. That leaves a lot of people left over who either aren't going to get better or may have this risk of getting manic. So this leads to recommendations from experts. The International Society for Bipolar Disorder Task Force points out this polarity issue and this mixedness uh, issue. Uh, polarity bipolar 1 versus bipolar 2 and mixed features. So antidepressants may be okay in a bipolar patient, so say the experts. If they've gotten well with an antidepressant before, part of evidence-based medicine is the patient's own evidence, right? You can't say, no, you only think you got better. Well, well maybe, but you know, you have to, have to clarify. If Mrs. Smith swears up and down that she got better with um, Starbucks coffee, okay, corroboration, I won't argue with that. Um, if that's really true. So you have to count their personal history as, as having some merit. So, no, I, I truly got better with an antidepressant. Counts for something. Um, and don't use them if you've got at least two of these psychomotor acceleration symptoms. Um, antidepressant monotherapy, bad idea in bipolar 1 patients because a higher risk for switch, plus they haven't been shown to work. And in a bipolar 2, maybe a different species, antidepressant monotherapy may be, may be just fine. How long do you keep them going? Evidence-based data would say, well, if you had a really terrific response in the front end, you may not rush to stop it, provided there's no emerging mania symptoms. And some of the Stanley Foundation data, in fact, say if you've had a really good response with an antidepressant acutely, you might very well want to stay on it for some number of months until there's a reason to stop it, because if you, if you stop it sooner, you may get depressed again. But again, that's that small minority of good responders. Most people who have a meh, response who get parked on the antidepressant, it's doing nothing except exposing them to a potentially unnecessary, if not harmful, medicine. FDA-approved treatments. 
for bipolar disorder, depressed phase, and treatment-resistant depression. We, we signal, signal this out because olanzapine plus fluoxetine, OFC, is a, a treatment approved in the U.S. for both bipolar depression and so-called treatment-resistant depression, unipolar depression. So um, uh, uh, different species, you know, olanzapine fluoxetine combination seems to work. Uh, the, the fluoxetine portion has not been shown to flip people up into a high when taken with olanzapine. Um, in in treatment-resistant unipolar disorder, aripiprazole, as we see on the left, actually as an add-on to antidepressants works, although in the studies in bipolar depression, it did not. I think that was one of the polling questions Dr. Yotham showed earlier. How can that be? They're different illnesses, at least at the extremes. Now, maybe someday someone will go back and dig in and say, well, maybe, maybe for the MDDMF patients, who were never identified in those studies before 2013. I don't know, maybe aripiprazole might work there. Um, but if you just look at the extremes of just unipolar depression, aripiprazole may have some value if there's mixed features. You know, aripiprazole does treat mixed states in mania. We don't know about MDDMF. And in bipolar depression, full syndrome of depression in bipolar patients, it hasn't been shown to work. The three uh, sort of formerly FDA approved treatments in bipolar depression besides olanzapine fluoxetine combination are quetiapine and lorazidone. Uh, let us have a deeper look here. Latest bipolar depression treatment guidelines. So you've been hearing about these as we've been going throughout the day. So uh, those three treatments I just mentioned are the first line treatments in the, the CANMAT, C-A-I-N-P, forthcoming revision of the guidelines. Uh, second steps, well, you know, what do you do second? Um, you know, lithium or valproate have some value, although one in four success rate with those in step BD. Combinations, um, novel treatments, uh, modafinil, primapexol, pioglitazone, as Dr. McIntyre was alluding. Carbamazepine with uh, 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 <coughs> free, easy, wanderer plus. That's a Chinese herb, and it's a second step augmentation strategy in CANMAT. Um, SSRIs come lower on the list, um, and then things that just haven't been so well studied are, are farther down on the list. Lamotrigine is not high on the list. It's, it's a fourth-line pick. We'll see why in a second. Here are those three first-line treatments that were described in CANMAT with nice, low numbers needed to treat, right? More variability with numbers needed to harm. We're always doing risks and benefits. So we would like a high number needed to harm, not a small one. And so with some of these agents, you can see weight gain, metabolic dysregulation, uh, sedation uh, with lorazidone, higher numbers needed to harm with things like sedation or, or weight gain. So that, that's helpful, and the low NNTs are certainly more evidence-based and encouraging than, say, an NNT of 29 with an antidepressant. Here's some data with bipolar depression with mixed features. So this was the original FDA registration trial of bipolar depression. Dr. McIntyre extracted out the presence of mixed features and found <coughs> Since lorazidone was not formally studied in mania, what if you've got low-grade mania symptoms during bipolar depression? It actually worked better than placebo uh, over the course of the clinical trial. So the presence of mixed features did not diminish responsivity of lorazidone in acute bipolar depression in adults. Uh, there also was one rather large randomized trial looking at unipolar depression with mixed features. In fact, I think this may be the only large randomized trial in the literature asking, well, what happens in a unipolar patient with the low-grade mania symptoms if they get lorazidone, 20 to 120 milligrams a day, I believe. Um, uh, and what we see here is a significant difference, quite progressively, steadily improving compared to placebo with a large effect size over a six-week trial. Uh, this prompted a recent expert guideline published at the end of last year in suggesting that of all the things that one might use, this has the most evidence base in a unipolar depressed patient with low-grade mania symptoms. Um, uh, breaking this out further, bipolar depression with, with subsyndromal hypomania, we see um, uh, comparable effects with lorazidone <coughs> regardless of um, uh, uh, just the presence of hypomania as compared to uh, the absence of hypomania. So hypomania during depression would not diminish responsivity to lorazidone. Why is lamotrigine a fourth-line choice in CANMAT? Because it hasn't been shown to work better than a placebo in five randomized controlled 
trials. If you pull them all together, you do get an effect. The NNT is about 12. So it's got evidence, it's got data, and we could quibble and say, oh, look, the placebo effects are high, and that's really why it didn't work. Or it worked better in the bipolar ones than the bipolar twos, or the baseline severity determined whether it worked or not. At the end of the day, um, um, it's an evidence-based treatment, albeit off-label in the US from the FDA, when used alone. When paired with another agent like l l lithium, all the way on the right, you actually do get a significant effect. So lamb lit, as we sometimes call it, counts as an evidence-based treatment in bipolar depression. Pioglitazone, the oral hypoglycemic, appears to have antidepressant properties. You heard some very fascinating things earlier, I think, from Dr. McIntyre about um, other metabolic regulators, such as liraglutide and perhaps others. So pioglitazone actually has made it into the CANMAT guidelines because it does seem to have a greater benefit than placebo net-net over time when added to lithium for treating bipolar depression. So I'll, I'll defer back to Dr. McIntyre's discussion for more detail in that regard. Armodafinil, um, the enantiomer of modafinil, stimulant-like drug, not a stimulant, not quite sure how it works, maybe the dopamine transporter, we're not entirely sure. It's not amphetamine, it's not methylphenidate, it's a wakefulness promoting agent. It does seem to have value for acute bipolar depression without switching someone into a mania or a hypomania. The size of the effect was not uh, humongous, although well, NNT of nine was actually better than, than 29. Um, um, placebo had a somewhat better response here in this, this clinical trial than the earlier ones did. It never had a definitive tie-breaking study to, to permit its registration with a regulatory agency. So it's an off-label use, but it's encouraging and um, uh, uh, may have other properties as well. It may help with cognition and attention. You heard a lot about cognition before. So uh, probably underutilized. It's a scheduled compound, not because of dependence or tolerance, but because of uh, likability or abuse abuse potential. Uh, patent's long gone with this drug now, so I'm not sure we're gonna see more research with it, but it belongs on the list of things that have evidence in treating bipolar depression. Long-term, antipsychotics. We hear a lot about using them in specific phases of illness. How about for relapse prevention? So here's a graphic that uh, I'll summarize real briefly in terms of anticipating from studies. Will this compound not just get you, but keep you well over time? So quetiapine fits the bill in all domains. It can prevent highs, lows, or both. Ziprazidone um, uh, actually has data uh, in preventing highs, but uh, not, not so clearly helpful in the lows. It wasn't broken out in the maintenance study. In the acute studies, ziprazidone was not that helpful for bipolar depression. The number needed to treat was 144. That's not very good. Uh, so we wouldn't count that. Uh, Aripiprazole, very nice effect in mania. Not such a clear-cut effect for the depressed phase, either acutely or preventatively. Olanzapine treats highs or lows. Um, and risperidone um, uh, was efficacious in treating highs. It actually has not been shown to prevent the lows. We need more randomized discontinuation trials. How long should you stay on this treatment before there's no longer a clear benefit? or the risks start to outweigh the benefits. When it comes to atypical antipsychotics, 24 weeks may be the sweet spot. What this graphic shows is that after you've gotten better from a mania with lithium or valparate plus an atypical antipsychotic, here it was olanzapine or risperidone, you clearly had a lower relapse risk with the first 24 weeks. And if there were metabolic problems, they were minimal enough so as to out, be outweighed by the benefit. But after 24 weeks, particularly with olanzapine, that benefit didn't seem to continue to favor uh, relapse prevention over adverse effects. So metabolic burden started to catch up and the benefit of relapse prevention started to attenuate. What does this mean practically? Mrs. Smith is better. What's the first thing she says? Can I stop my treatment now? It's like you put a cast on someone. Can I take it off now? No. How long should I stay on it? Um, ideally, one will not touch this treatment for six months at least not with, with more than minor tweaks, um, if one wishes to avoid relapse beyond 24 weeks. Not so clear that the continuation of the adjunctive atypical buys you more advantage, but after that time, metabolic burden starts to become more, more burdensome. You've been hearing a lot about cognition. 
Do we have something new to say here? Yes, we do. So this is an interesting study published earlier this year, <coughs> again by Dr. Yotham, looking at lorazidone in euthymic bipolar patients where the target symptoms of interest were cognition, so not mood, just asking, the, compared to usual treatment, does adding on lorazidone make a difference with respect to improving cognitive functioning? 34 patients, um, euthymic, but having cognitive symptoms. Um, um, half or more of people with bipolar disorder will manifest problems with executive functioning, attention, verbal memory. It's not because they have ADD necessarily, it's because that's part of what gets inherited. Their first degree relatives may have those cognitive symptoms as well, so it's part of what gets passed along. Again, it's not just mood. It's not even just sleep or energy or suicide risk. It may be cognitive functioning as well, and it's an often under-identified target of treatment. So augmentation of lorazidone, 20 to 80 milligrams a day, average dose a little under 50 milligrams a day. What did it show? Okay, everybody read this line by line by line. I'll highlight for you the main finding is the top row. Global cognitive functioning was significantly improved over the course of the clinical trial with lorazidone as compared to placebo. This is a really important finding because these are euthymic patients, so you can't say it was spurious. You can't say, well, their, their depression got better. They weren't depressed. Or their mania got better. Well, they weren't manic. They, they were having objectively measured cognitive symptoms and globally speaking, domains of attention, executive function, memory, all improved <coughs> better with a large effect, 0.82, Cohen's D, as compared to just usual treatment alone. And again, these were euthymic patients. So we don't see a difference in change in mania or depression or global symptoms because that's not what the target of the treatment was. This was a nice, clean study <coughs> taking a clear, targeted approach at just cognitive function. Adverse effects, as described. <coughs> okay. So successful self-management strategies for bipolar disorder. You can have a wonderful treatment, but you've got to make sure it's taken properly. Issues around adherence, education, maintaining a regular sleep-wake cycle, um, identifying communication patterns within families and targeting things like negative uh, expressed emotion and so on. Early recognition of prodromes. These are all the targeted goals of psychoeducation. You can't just hand someone the medicine and send them on their way any differently than you can't just give a diabetic patient their insulin and not address lifestyle issues or factors that can make things better or worse. And indeed, when, when research has looked at uh, psychosocial treatments for bipolar disorder, here are some of the basic principles, catching early warning signs, uh, identifying maladaptive thinking patterns like all or none thinking or I'll never get that job, why bother, or I can't not get that job, why even interview for it, the assumptions that people can, can make with this illness, recognizing the interpersonal factors that can uh, modulate mood, comes from interpersonal social rhythm therapy, family-focused therapy. These are, these are all uh, augmentations of pharmacology, not substitutes for pharmacology that, that have been shown to improve recovery and overall outcome. So to conclude, DSM-5 uh, invites us to use the mixed features specifier as an expansion of its previous incarnation of mixed episodes. It now bears on bipolar 2 as well as bipolar 1 does not require a full syndrome to have clinical importance. They can be common, more common than you might think if you systematically evaluate the symptoms of both poles in any mood disorder patient, unipolar or bipolar. <coughs> Mixed features are common in all phases of treatment, and we've talked about the many clinical and functional correlates, negative correlates, as well as recurrence risk with both subsyndromal symptoms and residual symptoms. Significant risks around suicide, substance use, comorbidity, um, and uh, so on, as we talked about. Appropriate treatment really does need to take into account both poles of the illness. Okay, with that, I shall stop, and thank you for listening.